everyone! In today's video I'm just going to be going through how you might like to answer a question which kind of asks you about psychology being seen as a science. So first it's quite nice just to go through what type of question could be asked of you. So you could be given a longer answer question which could be say 10 to 12 marks and you may be asked to discuss the arguments for and against psychology being considered a science. And this is quite a broad question to have. Or you could instead have a shorter answer question which is more specific on any of the individual components and this could be perhaps a four or a six mark question. So an example of this would be asking you to outline what is meant by objectivity and empirical testing. This could go on further just to ask you where this is shown within psychology. And for this you just have to give a quick example as to where we see this within psychology and the approaches is always a nice place to go. So now I'm just going to be going through the different features of a science which are mentioned within the specification and so you do need to know. So we have this idea that science must be objective and use empirical methods of testing. If you were to talk about this, you would first want to define what this actually means. So objectivity is where the researcher does not impose any of their own ideas or beliefs upon what they are testing and instead rely purely on the facts. Empirical methods of testing are where all data is collected through direct experiments and observations and again this isn't based on just beliefs or arguments so everything they are saying can be shown through direct experiments and observations. So once you've defined this fully and you're happy with your definition you'll want to move on to give examples of where this is shown within psychology. So a good example of this is the behaviourist approach because it shows both objectivity and uses empirical methods of testing. And you'll want to go on to explain why and how this is shown. So for example, it was conducted in a lab, of course that shows both objectivity and met empirical methods of testing. And so Pavlov did not exert only his own beliefs, but he showed it purely through experiments. Another key way this is shown is through the cognitive theorist, as they do show again both objectivity and use empirical methods of testing and you'll just want to go on to say how this is shown. And then you'll want to go on to give examples of where this isn't shown within psychology. So of course we've got the psychodynamic approach, which was based upon case studies and just the assumptions from Freud. Of course, this cannot undergo testing because it was mainly based upon these ideas of the id, ego and superego, which are just a construct within your mind. It's always nice to give examples of where this both is and isn't shown within psychology, just to keep that nice balanced argument. So depending on the style of the question, you may want to give your conclusion here and you'd quickly sum up everything you've said as well as saying whether or not you feel psychology is objective and does use empirical methods of testing. You also need to make sure that you link everything back to the question. Next, you've got the idea that science tests theories and allows for hypotheses to be tested. So first, you'll just again want to define what this means. So a theory is a set of laws that can explain different events and behaviours. And then you've got your hypothesis, which of course is a prediction made at the start of an experiment indicating what could happen. You may also want to go on to explain that they need to be worded in a way that allows for testing, meaning that they're operationalised. You may also want to include the fact that we've got experimental and null hypotheses. And again, depending on the type of question, you may want to go on to explain further that hypotheses then need to be tested in order to see if they're supported or refuted. If the hypothesis isn't supported, it will need to be revised. Deriving these new hypotheses from theories is known as deduction. It may then be a good idea just to go on to give an example of a theory and a hypothesis. And as I've noted here, a good area for this is memory, just because there's a lot of research there that we've learned about. And so you could easily just stick in one of those and give what the hypothesis would have been as well as what the theory is. So for example, capacity, duration, and coding of short-term memory. You could of course integrate these examples into your definitions instead just so that everything flows nicely and everything you've worded so far is clear. Next we've got this idea of paradigms and the paradigm shift. So again the first thing to do would be to define what this means. So of course a paradigm is a set of assumptions and methods of which all sciences have agreed upon. It's been said that social sciences lack this shared paradigm and so are more pre-sciences. Next you've got the paradigm shift which is when an accepted paradigm is challenged and the evidence against the existing paradigm is too great to ignore. And this in turn leads to a scientific revolution and then a new paradigm. So because it's been said that social sciences lack this shared paradigm, 
he may then want to go into explain how psychology actually differs. So of course, instead of having a paradigm, psychology has these levels of explanation. You may then want to go into explain why psychology doesn't have this paradigm, and it's of course, it's just because psychology has too many differing theories. And this is clearly seen through our different approaches. You may then want to go on to give examples of the different approaches and how these contradict each other. And so finally, we've just got this idea of falsifiability and replicability. So again, the first thing you'd want to do is just to define what each of these mean. So falsifiability is the idea that a theory cannot be considered scientific until it admits to the possibility of being proven false. And this was of course suggested by Karl Popper and we have seen this within some of the topics beforehand. So scientific theories can constantly be challenged in order to try and be proven false. And this is why scientific theories are constantly replicated and are never just carried out once. However, some psychological theories cannot undergo this testing and thus are unfalsifiable. And a key example of this is the psychodynamic approach because it's based purely upon Freud's assumptions as well as the case studies of little hands. Next, we move on to this idea of replicability. So for a theory to be trusted, it must be shown to be replicable over a series of different contexts and times. And replication is also key because it's used to show that a theory is valid. And so in order for a replication to take place, reports must be made. And it's key that these reports show a high level of scientific rigor. If this scientific rigor isn't there, and the process isn't completely documented, then a replication will not be able to take place. And it's this replication that needs to be taken place in order to show that something is falsifiable. And then here, just like we've seen within some of the other elements, you might want to go on to give examples of different psychological theories and topics which are both falsifiable and replicable, and then ones that aren't falsifiable and replicable. As I said at the start of the video, the type of question asked of you will definitely change what you choose to talk about. If it's a longer answer question, you want to give your points and then give the conclusion at the very end, as opposed to giving the conclusion after each point. However, if it's just a shorter answer question on an individual component, you'd of course give your conclusion once you've spoken about that component itself. I hope this video was useful in showing you how you might go about answering a question, which just asks you to talk about psychology being considered a science.